right, hey everybody, welcome to the final video for the Animals 2 Lab. We're going to be doing Activity 4, which focuses on the class Mammalia. So hopefully you guys are a little bit familiar with mammals, because we are mammals. So just be sure that um, as we're going through the material, that you are taking notes, you're looking at the provided lectures and supplementary material, so you can really hone in on your knowledge of mammals. And then pause the video as you see fit to take notes if you need to. And then once you feel comfortable with the material, go ahead and answer the associated questions on your worksheet. But let's go ahead and get started. So there's a lot of different mammals out there. Um, we're really going to focus on the order Artiodactyl in the family Suidae, which you guys probably know as pigs. But there are a variety of different mammals out there. Um, we can definitely can't touch on all of them in this small course, but there's a lot of cool mammals out there. You can take a class like Mammalogy to learn more about those. And um, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about some pigs. So. Pigs are bilaterally symmetric. They are also deuterostomes. They are chordates. But um, comparing them to the frogs that we previously talked about, pigs are endotherms. And so remember that uh, ectotherms were organisms that relied on the external environment to regulate their body temperatures. But endotherms do are the opposite of that, and that they can maintain their own body temperature. And so basically, you can think of us, we rely on metabolism in order to heat our bodies. So basically, our organs function and doing their thing allows for the release of heat that will internally keep our bodies at a certain temperature. And so endotherms are often referred to as warm-blooded animals. But in order to regulate your own temperature, you need a lot of energy. So we really have to be efficient in how we obtain nutrients and how we're moving blood through our system in order to keep that level of metabolism so that we can stay warm enough to function. So besides um, being warm-blooded and needing a lot of energy, um, mammals as well as specifically pigs, um, respiration occurs through our lungs, which is no surprise because we breathe all the time. But um, the difference in mammals versus frogs is that um, breathing occurs due to the muscle contraction of the diaphragm. Basically, um, the diaphragm kind of helps to uh, pull air into the lungs, like suctioning it in and then um, pushing it out. But yeah, basically your diaphragm is a sheet of skeletal muscle that extends across the bottom of the thoracic cavity and allows for the expansion and contraction of the lungs. And then finally, we have a four-chambered heart, which consists of two atrium and two ventricles. And so we'll talk more in detail about the circulatory system of pigs and mammals in general. But just remember that um, comparing to our amphibian heart, the amphibian heart had two atrium and one ventricle. So um, definitely some major developments in how this helps pigs to be endotherms, but more on that later. So we'll briefly look at the anatomy of a pig. Most of you have probably seen a pig in your lifetime, but um, I just want to kind of point out some of these different parts of the body. So again, we have our heart kind of central in the body cavity here, and then we have our two lungs, and directly below the lungs we have the diaphragm, which remember allows for the expansion and contraction of the lungs. So I would take a minute, you can pause the video to get a better look at this um, diagram of a pig, but we will also provide you guys with a video of a pig dissection as well. But all right, let's go ahead and talk about the circulatory system in a pig slash mammal. So as I mentioned before, their heart is different from amphibians and that it has a right and left ventricle instead of one large ventricle. So we're starting with, um, oh, I guess it's important to mention that arteries are shown in red. The red lines are arteries, whereas the blue lines are veins. But other than that, let's go ahead and talk about how blood moves through the circulatory system. 
So if we're starting with blood that are leaving the various body systems, um, basically this blood is coming through veins towards the heart and it's low in pressure and it's low in oxygen content. So at that point, this low pressure, low oxygenated blood is entering the right atrium and passing through to the right ventricle. So this is allowing the blood to be basically pressurized and then sent to the lungs. So it's traveling through blood vessels or in this case, arteries, and it is now pressurized but still low in oxygen content. And this blood will use an artery and enter into the lungs where the blood is now able to become oxygenated and increase that oxygen content. So as the blood is leaving the lungs now through a vein and returning back towards the heart, it is low in pressure, but it's high in oxygen content. So we've gone through this pulmonary loop, we've oxygenated our blood, but now we need to repressurize it so it can travel to the rest of the body. So through this vein, we're now entering the left atrium and then in turn passing through the left ventricle. And uh, this is what's allowing the um, blood to become pressurized. It's not using up any oxygen content. So then as blood is leaving the left ventricle through our systemic loop or entering the systemic loop through an artery, it is now pressurized and has a high oxygen content. So we're bringing this oxygen-rich blood into our various body systems within the pig or mammal's body. So oxygen is dispersed to these body systems as it needs to, so the body continue or can continue to function. And then we get back to where we have low pressure, low oxygenated blood, leaving the body systems, entering the right atrium, and the cycle repeats. So if we're looking at how blood flows, it typically starts from arteries. Uh, we're looking at arteries, veins, and capillaries. So we have oxygenated blood that's traveling away from the heart in an artery. Um, as we are branching off from the artery, we get into our arteriole and our capillaries. And basically, we're just getting into smaller and smaller um, blood vessels. And as the blood is getting to the capillary level or the, those smaller blood vessels, um, oxygen is able to diffuse to various tissues and cells that need it. And yeah, it's just diffusing out of the capillaries. And then our oxygen poor blood, um, again, the oxygen is being dispersed, it's going away from the blood. So we have blood with low oxygen content that is then traveling from capillaries and going back to the hearts through the venule and veins. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So now we've talked a little bit about the um, circulatory system. So we can talk now about the respiratory system. So pigs are able to breathe by taking in air through their nostrils. Um, the air travels down through their trachea and enters their lungs. And again, the kind of important innovation that mammals have is the presence of that diaphragm. Remember that um, the diaphragm is just a membrane that separates the abdominal and thoracic cavities. But basically during the process of breathing, the diaphragm pulls downward towards the pelvis and this causes air to be suctioned into the lungs. So you can think of it as the diaphragm um, pulling downward, kind of expanding and forcing air into your lungs. And then when the diaphragm releases or starts to contract, air is then pushed out of the lungs. And so this is the general breathing process that occurs that allows oxygen or air to go in and out of the lungs. And so once the air is filled the lungs, um, blood with the pulmonary artery becomes oxygenated and travels through the body. All right, and then we can finally talk briefly about the pig digestive system. And so digestive or digestion occurs the same way as it does to the frog. However, the organs evolved in size are drastically different. So um, we still follow that same pathway. Food, food is coming from the mouth, going down the esophagus, entering the stomach. From the stomach, it, is, um, it starts the process of digestion and then will travel into the large intestine, followed by the small intestine where eventually um, your food waste product will pass out through the rectum and then anus.
But um, one important thing to note is you can even see it in the, uh, the cross section where this uh, pig has been dissected, is that rather than having very thin skin that allows for cutaneous respiration like the frog has, you can see that the outer layer of skin of the frog, or <laughs> the frog, the pig is fattier and thicker, which is really important for maintaining heat. Because remember, these are endotherms, they're generating their own heat. And if you have thin skin, then you're gonna lose a lot of that heat to the environment. So thick fatty skin really helps to uh, maintain that homeostasis, keeping that warm body temperature. All right. So kind of our take home message for this lab, um, kind of comparing between our frog and our pig systems. Remember that frogs have a more muscular stomach than pigs. And this is to help them um, break down the exoskeletons of insects, which makes up a majority of their diet. Um, also, uh, the skin of frogs is much thinner than that of a pig. Uh, as I was just talking about, um, that thin skin allows them to perform cutaneous respiration as a means to obtain oxygen, an alternate breathing pattern, so to speak. Um, that being said, pigs can't do cutaneous respiration. They can't breathe through their skin. So they rely on um, oxygen through breathing through their lungs. They have to maintain their own body temperature. So in turn, pigs have uh, skin that is thickened with a fat layer for insulation which is really there to help maintain that internal body temperature. And then finally, remember that pigs are endotherms while frogs are ectotherms. And so for this reason, pigs have a long small intestine to maximize the amount of nutrients that they can absorb through um, digestion. And they balance the energy spent by maintaining their body temperature. So remember being an endotherm is a lot more energetically expensive and so you really need to be efficient in digestion and pull as many nutrients out of um, your food as possible because maintaining all of these body functions is high energy. And if you can't maintain your body functions and you can't maintain your temperature and then you're going to have a bad time. But um, all right, other than that, that really uh, concludes what we're going to be talking about for the Animals 2 Lab. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either me or your lab instructor. Study up, and I will see you all next week in lab.